오늘 이제 오늘의 발제자인 프로드 소렌슨 씨를 소개해드리겠습니다. 프로드 소렌슨 씨는 EU의 통신 규제 기관인 유럽 전자 통신 규제 기구 벨에게 2016년 그 망중립성 가이드라인 및 보고서 작성을 주도한 망중립성 전문가 워킹 그룹의 공동 의장이셨습니다. 이 망중립성 전문가 워킹 그룹은 2010년부터 2018년 까지 활동을 했고요. 그래서 망중립 유해 이후의 망중립성법과 가이드라인 성안에 기여를 많이 했고 지금은 이제 망중립성 가이드라인이 제정된 이후에는 그 오픈 인터넷 워킹 그룹으로 이름이 바뀌어서 그 이유 안에서 망중립성이 어떻게 잘 이행이 되고 있는지를 감시하는 그런 워킹 그룹으로 바뀌었고 지금 그리고 노르웨이의 방통위 같은 거죠. 노르웨이 통신 위원회 앤 코미인가요? 여기에 수석 자문으로 계십니다. 큰 박수로 맞아주시기 바랍니다. Um, I will give a presentation today about um, net neutrality in, in Europe. Um, I will give a description of this regulation. Um, I understand uh, it's a hot topic in, in Korea as, as it always is around the globe. Uh, it's also uh, a big discussion in Europe, of course, and, and in, in Norway, my home country. So I know about the, the discussions going on, I understand them. Um, I can, of course, not take a side in the discussion in Korea. I don't know the details you have, and it's not my job. So what I will do today is just to describe net neutrality, how it is done in Europe. Even closer, okay. Um, so my, my presentation today will be uh, strictly descriptive. Um, briefly about myself, even though I have been introduced already, uh, I come from Norway, it's a country in the north of Europe. Uh, it's cold, exactly as it's outside here, it's the same temperature. I work for the Norwegian regulator uh, and we issued guidelines for net neutrality in 2009. And these guidelines were issued together with uh, the stakeholders. So we had a working group developing these guidelines. And I work as a senior advisor in net neutrality in, in ENCOM. Norway is also a member of the European Economic Area. And um, uh, this is almost the same as the European Union. So I guess the European Union is more well known for you than the European Economic Area. But, but it's more or less the same concept. Uh, Norway is not a member of the Union, but we are a member of the economic area. So therefore, uh, the net neutrality regulation in Europe is also applicable for, for Norway. Uh, the different regulators, the national regulators in Europe, they are organized in, in a European organization called BEREC, uh, Body of European Regulators for Electronic Communications is, is this abbreviation. Uh, this organization has uh, several working groups and one of those working groups is the Net Neutrality Working Group which is now uh, renamed to the Open Internet Expert Working Group, so it's the same group. I have been chairing this group since it was uh, initiated in 2010 uh, until last year. So I'm, I'm not the chair of the group for, for, for this uh, current year anymore. My presentation will be divided into five different topics. I will first give an overview of the European net neutrality regulation. Then I will dive into four different topics, more specifically, uh, about traffic management and specialized services. These are relatively technical topics, and uh, they also are very relevant for the ongoing 5G discussion, uh, which we also have in Europe these days. Then I will describe how IP interconnection uh, is um, done in, in Europe, uh, give an overview of that. And finally, look at the zero rating topic, which is a, a new topic, one could say, uh, under the net neutrality umbrella. Uh, this is uh, not fully um, solved uh, or... or how it should be regulated is not fully uh, developed yet in Europe, but we have a framework which I will describe. 
So briefly about net neutrality. This is the view end users have of the internet. They have their computers and they communicate to content servers. The end users do not know usually about the networks in between. But when I speak about the internet in this presentation and when we speak about net neutrality, it's the transportation of information between the client computer and the server computer. That is uh, the core of net neutrality. The internet is different from other telecommunications networks because when you want to implement an application or provide some content on the internet, you don't have to do any changes to, to the communications network. You just buy a server, you buy an internet connection, and you install some software on this server and thereby you can connect to the whole internet, to the whole world. This is nothing you could do in, in the traditional telecommunications networks. So this is uh, uh, totally new um, when it was introduced. It's not new today, of course. And when we discuss net neutrality, uh, net neutrality is focused on the, the communications network. So it's not focused on the servers but it focused on the communication between the servers and between the servers and the clients on the network. And when we speak about net neutrality, application agnosticism is an important topic, an important concept. When we say uh, it's application agnostic, it means that when you have an application on the internet, all the applications receive the same treatment on the internet. That's the core idea of net neutrality all applications should be treated equally. It doesn't mean you have identical communication services because uh, it depends, for example, on the access speed you have. If you have a quick, fast internet access, then, of course, you have better performance. But when the traffic is in the network, then it's uh, treated equally for all the applications. Net neutrality is closely related to internet, so it could actually be called internet neutrality. Um, and also when we look backwards in the history, uh, net neutrality was introduced as a concept related to, to, to the internet. And net neutrality is actually a very new concept. Um, it was introduced in 2003, many of you may know that already. Um, and um, uh, the most well-known regulation in net neutrality is the, uh, the US regulation, but also Norway was relatively early. It was the first uh, regulatory approach to net neutrality in Europe was uh, introduced in, in Norway. And we will speak mostly about uh, the European regulation, which was finalized in 2015. Even though the concept is new, uh, we should also be aware that the technology itself, the internet technology, is actually um, a manifestation of net neutrality. So the way the internet worked originally uh, is actually um, the source for the concept net neutrality. That's the idea, the underlying idea. Sometimes we also meet concepts from tra traditional telecommunications uh, and compare to, to um, telephony, the very old way of communicating, uh, the internet is 50 years old uh, this year and the whole area of, of internet uh, of telecommunications is 150 years. So it, it's actually a relatively short period of the communications history that we are covering here. You may be m more aware of the US regulation of net neutrality since it's um, where it started uh, and um, in many cases, also in Europe, the, the regulation in the US is, is the most known when it comes to net neutrality. But uh, net neutrality was introduced uh, in Norway and in, um, in Europe in 2009. In 2009, uh, it was barely visible, one could say, in the so-called telecommunications package. Uh, there was a, a goal to achieve net neutrality, but no specific rules. But in 2015, rules were introduced. In Norway, we had rules from 2009, and these rules were so-called soft law, 
so it was not uh, implemented uh, in the national law, but there were guidelines uh, that were up upheld by, by the industry and supervised by, by uh, the Norwegian regulator, ENCOM. When the European net neutrality regulation was introduced, we also introduced this in Norway. So we have today exactly the same regulation as they have all over Europe in my country. One could also say that the development uh, of net neutrality has moved from the US and uh, today one could say that in Europe you have a stronger uh, protection of net neutrality than you have in the US. This may change over time, but, but in, in Europe this is implemented in the law and, and changing the law in Europe is not quickly done. So we, we uh, can assume that we will have net neutrality regulation for uh, the foreseeable future in, in Europe. Of course, things may change over time, but that, that would take many years if it should happen. When it comes to uh, regulation of net neutrality in Europe, uh, there are actually two layers. I will not uh, present every detail on this slide. Uh, you can study them afterwards. But I want to emphasize that the legislator in Europe uh, provides the laws, of course. And, and in Europe, you have the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the Council. And these three bodies, um, uh, based on, on the constitution of the European Union, uh, are working together to develop a net neutrality regulation or any other regulation. This regulation was um, uh, agreed among the, the lawmakers in Europe in 2015. Um, the law became applicable in 2016, so, so there was some period of introduction of the law. In this law, uh, there was a mandate given to BEREC. This organization received uh, a job to do afterwards. So BEREC developed guidelines uh, which clarified the details of net neutrality regulation in Europe. These guidelines were published in 2016. So my presentation today will cover both uh, the regulation provided by the lawmakers and also the guidelines provided by BEREC. It's important also to realize that uh, the enforcement of, of the laws is thereby provided in three steps. As I already explained, uh, the regulation itself is provided by lawmakers, BEREC provides the guidelines, but the enforcement of these uh, rules is done nationally in the different countries in Europe. So in the European Economic Area, there are around 30 different countries, of which Norway is one of those, as I have explained already. So if there is a case related to net neutrality in Norway, it is ENCOM who decides, who judges, judges this case. It will not be BEREC. So BEREC is only providing guidance. So if there is a complaint, people have to complain to the national regulator. BEREC, of course, has a coordinating role between the different uh, countries, but they do not take decisions in cases. I will then move over to uh, one of the four uh, specific topics. So the first one is uh, traffic management. It's a bit technical, so uh, I will explain a little bit about how traffic is sent through the Internet and thereby also explain how net neutrality um, provides rules for that. In the same instance, I will also cover the 5G versus net neutrality discussion. Uh, not all of it. There will be two aspects. As you can see on, on the overall content, there is a next topic coming up, which is specialized services. So that is also related to 5G. So I will not cover all 5G topics in the traffic management uh, section, but, but some of it will be covered in this section. Um, some uh, stakeholders have expressed that uh, net neutrality regulation gives problems for implementation of 5G networks. Uh, 
Barak uh, has uh, published a report in December last year answering to this and this is how I will uh, summarize uh, this answer. There are many different aspects of traffic management that influences uh, this. First of all, we have the regulation of traffic on the internet, which I will explain briefly. Then we also have the concepts of reasonable traffic management, quality of service traffic classes, and exceptional traffic management. These concepts I will describe afterwards and these are elements of the European Net Neutrality Regulation. So these four bullet points explains that there is a lot of uh, possibility to do traffic management on the internet and thereby also in the 5G network when it comes to production of internet access services. I will afterwards in the next section describe the other services that are not internet access. Um, how is traffic managed on the internet? This is a model describing how it works. Many of you may have seen these or similar uh, figures. Uh, so usually traffic is transported through the network and when you want to add some intelligence to the network, uh, for example a voice service or, or a content uh, service, this will be introduced in the endpoint and we usually describe this as the application layer. Traffic management can thereby be handled in two different places in the network. It can be handled at the network layer, that is where traffic is sent back and forth through the network, but it can also be implemented in the endpoints. Uh, and that is an important part of how traffic is regulated on the network, on the internet already today, because when uh, your computer sends traffic to the internet, it will not send more traffic than there is capacity for. So if you send more traffic to the internet than there is capacity for, there will be uh, feedback from the network whereby your endpoint will slow down its communication. In addition to these two ways of um, uh, regulating traffic on the internet, sometimes the network provider will also introduce application layer functionality inside the network. So this is a specific uh, type of traffic management and I will come back to that. So the first type of traffic management is handled in the endpoints. Uh, as I described on the previous slide, uh, the endpoints will regulate their own traffic. They will not send more traffic into the internet than there is capacity for. And this is uh, not regulated by the, by the law. The law is only regulating what happens inside the network. So if you buy a computer or a smartphone or any type of device you want to connect to the internet, the law will not regulate these devices. So therefore, any kind of traffic management provided by a terminal would be in line with the regulation. And it's important to realize that um, uh, the endpoint takes some responsibility when it comes to how traffic is sent into the network. I will not go into all of the technical details, but many of you may have heard about the TCP protocol, which is an example about how traffic is limited when you are connected to the internet. Uh, the second step of traffic uh, management uh, is so-called reasonable traffic management. Uh, this term is used differently in different regulations. So in European regulation it doesn't have exactly the same meaning as it has in some other regulations. Um, in European regulation you usually distinguish between reasonable traffic management on the one hand and exceptional traffic management on the other hand. In other uh, regulations these two are, are uh, there is only one term, one concept describing these two ways of regulating traffic. When traffic is, is sent into the network, the operator is allowed to do reasonable traffic management. Reasonable traffic management is handling so-called categories of traffic, which means that different quality of service levels may be uh, allowed in the network by the provider. Uh, it will not be allowed to do deep packet inspection on the traffic in that case. Um, 
and um, um, uh, Barak has described uh, a definition of w how we interpret the term specific content. Uh, this way of doing traffic management is not commonly implemented. Uh, there is another way of doing traffic management that is more common. And that is what we in Barrack describe as quality of service classes. Um, when uh, you buy an internet access in the fixed network, uh, you are used to buying different speeds of the access. So thereby you have different qualities when you access the internet. Um, this is usually not done in the mobile network. When you have an access to the mobile network, you usually have full speed. At least in Norway, in, in many European countries, that is the case. But in a few European countries, uh, traffic classes are introduced also in mobile networks. And that is done by... Uh, um, uh, to by, by uh, doing a configuration of the access whereby different quality of service parameters may be fine-tuned to provide different speeds for the access. This would also be in line with the regulation. Finally, we have the term exceptional traffic management. Uh, this term is in some regulations also a part of, of the reasonable traffic management but in Europe we have a specific term for that. Uh, these uh, exceptions are three types. It's uh, uh, legislative measures in case of some content should be uh, uh, considered to be illegal, for example. Uh, the ISP may be um, told by, by the authorities to stop that kind of content. Uh, the second type of uh, Exceptional traffic management is network integrity in case, in case of different security um, threats in the network. The ISP is of course allowed to stop these threats. Uh, so it could be denial of service attacks, hacking and these kinds of measures. This would be considered to be in line with the reg regulation to do. Finally, there is also a possibility to do congestion management in addition to, to the congestion management I described already, uh, this would in that case be application-specific congestion management, uh, which would be exceptional. Specialized services um, is an important concept when it comes to net neutrality. Um, and it's also closely related to the 5G discussion, uh, which I will cover. So I will describe what is specialized services and also discuss a little bit about how 5G versus net neutrality uh, could be understood based on the concept specialized services. <coughs> specialized services is an important concept because um, as a regulator we are not interested in regulating everything. That's not the goal. Uh, the goal with regulation of net neutrality is to protect the internet to protect the internet as a communication platform for, for uh, the citizens, for, for businesses, etc. But it's not uh, necessary to regulate any kind of communications. So those services that are not internet access services, they are simply termed uh, specialized services. This is a kind of a regulatory concept. Uh, this concept has different names in different uh, regulations. It's sometimes also called managed services. Uh, and in the US regulation, it, it's simply called uh, other services than Internet access services. And this concept is also to some extent used in the, Norwegian, in, sorry, in the European uh, regulation. Uh, it has also been argued that innovation of specialized services is important, and, and that is true. But I will also emphasize here that uh, it's a difference between um, this kind of innovation and the innovation on the internet because on the internet you can do innovation without permission. If you want to innovate a specialized service you, ha you need to have a business agreement with the provider of the service. If you want to provide a service on the internet you just have to buy an internet access and then you can compete immediately. You, do you don't need to negotiate with the ISP to provide an application. 
as I described in the introduction, uh, the application is independent of the network. But in case of specialized services, there is a dependency. We'll come back to that. Uh, specialized services can, can best be described by a simple model. So this model describes uh, you as an end user with your terminal equipment accessing the internet through some access network. It could be mobile network or fixed network. And thereby you can communicate all over the globe with different ISPs. In many cases, it doesn't have to be that, but in many cases, this access provider also wants to provide other services. These are the services called specialized services. Uh, a typical example of specialized service is um, uh, voice over IP service and um, IPTV services. These are the two typical examples used in, in Europe, and I understand they are also known in, in Korea. This model needs some further explanation to, to be understood, because you can't provide any specialized service. There has to be some conditions you have to look into. Uh, one thing uh, that, uh, that is <laughs> the complexity of the model, uh, on the other hand, is when do you have a specialized service and when do you have an access to the internet? A relatively <coughs> concrete way of assessing that is that when you have an, an internet access service, then you have this independence between the content providers and the ISP. Specialized service will typically be in some kind of a closed network where you need a business agreement with the provider of the network to implement your service. It could either be the ISP itself implementing the service or it, it could be a third party uh, agree, uh, having an agreement with the ISP. But also specialized services may have interconnection between different ISPs. For example, voice over IP, you can call from one provider to another one. So thereby you have many similarities between specialized services and the internet access. Um, Returning to this question about 5G and net neutrality, uh, I think one of the main arguments that 5G and net neutrality are compatible is exactly specialized services. The specialized services uh, explains how many of the business ideas you have in 5G can be implemented. Uh, the net neutrality rules in Europe uh, clearly explains that if you have quality of service requirements for a service that cannot be provided on the internet, then you can provide it as a specialized service. <coughs> In addition to that, uh, there is also a requirement that this specialized service should not be to the detriment of the general quality of the Internet Access Service. So I will explain these two aspects of the services on the next slides. These two requirements can be described, the first one as the necessity requirement. So the regulation clearly says that if you want to provide a specialized service, <coughs> then it has to be in order to have specific requirements for quality of service. <clears throat> so many of the business ideas you have for 5G networks you've heard about would typically have this, uh, this quality of service <coughs> requirements. Secondly, the other requirement you could describe as the capacity requirement. So if an ISP wants to provide specialized services, then there has to be sufficient capacity for the specialized service in addition to the Internet Access Service he is providing. So thereby there is a safeguard for the Internet Access Service. This is described further in some details. Um, I can see I have some limited time, so I will not go through all of the details. Um, the requirement about and not degrading the Internet Access Service is described as it should not be to the detriment of the general quality of the Internet Access Service. This term, general quality of Internet Access Service, is not easily explained. 
it's a term introduced by the lawmakers. Um, so it is what we have in the law, and Barak is doing the best it can to interpret how it should be understood. Um, but I also foresee that we will need some time to elaborate exactly in detail how it should be understood. But what we can read from the regulation is a couple of things. Um, on this slide I have first of all uh, explained that in Article 5.1 of the regulation um, uh, the, NR, the, the, the task of the regulator is described. The NRA abbreviation is the National Regulatory Authority, so NRA is the regulator. So the regulator shall promo promote the continued availability of non-discriminatory internet access service at levels of quality that reflects advances in technology. So this is a demand to the regulators that we should also take into account that technology evolves over time. So it means that what is sufficient capacity for internet access service today may not be sufficient the next year because new technologies provides new performances in the network. So to some extent, we, you also have to take into account the growing capacity of, of, of the technology. This um, can further be understood based on uh, another part of the regulation uh, in recital 17. You can re read a longer text. It's a very long text, so I've taken an extract here. But the, this text describes, uh, first of all, that um, the ISPs have to take into account uh, the general quality of the Internet Access Service. Uh, so this is a demand given on, on the ISP. In addition to that, the regulator also has a job to do. The regulator has to check whether this degradation takes place or not. So this is a part of, uh, typically a part of the um, annual reporting uh, the regulators do about net neutrality in each country. But Barak uh, already foresees that uh, taking a clear judgment about whether the, the general quality is degraded or not is not easily done. So Barak will do further work on this and Barak is also developing a measurement tool related to net neutrality that um, could be used to further uh, fine-tune uh, this methodology to check whether there is a degradation or not from the specialized service. Uh, finally, in the 5G discussion, I would also like to look back on the past. It's not the first time we hear that new technology is incredibly good, and it is incredibly good, so I don't uh, want to challenge that. But on the other hand, um, it's true that the development takes time. First of all, you have to develop the standard, then you have to develop the equipment, and then you have to install the equipment, uh, um, deploy it, uh, and then you have to market the services and see whether end users buy the services. So all of this takes very long time uh, and quality of service is nothing new. We had it already in the 3G network and maybe you are already starting to take away the 3G because now you have the 4G in Korea. Uh, it's happening in Europe uh, at least. So there is a long history of quality of service. So whether the quality of service in the 5G will be that fundamentally different remains to be seen. It may be fundamentally different, but it will take time to, to, to check it out. And also when it comes to services provided based on quality of service, we have seen that it takes a long time to implement services um, based on quality of service. Uh, these are, are the so-called specialized services. And, and some of you may be technically skilled and recognize some of the, of the abbreviations. I will not go through all of these. But um, the voice over LTE may be known to many of you. 
and it took many years to develop voice over LTE, uh, but now it's starting to um, to to be used extensively in 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 the ISPs uh, networks. Uh, but it took a long time to build on the quality of service, and thereby also could provide the voice over LTE service based on that. We have also heard some discussions about the rich communication services and, and these new services, and they are gradually coming up. But it remains to be seen how they can compete with Skype, Viber, and WhatsApp, for example, when it comes to telephony. So when the ISPs argue they have many specialized services coming up, uh, yes, I guess they will, but uh, let's see how many they will be in the short term. I think it could take some time. And that would also give time for the regulators to adopt. adopt. Uh, we have to check out uh, how uh, the, the um, regulation should be used. Um, the net neutrality regulation is relatively new in Europe, so it's not easy for the ISP. They are arguing that, that it's difficult. To, to know how to um, follow the rules, but it's also difficult for the regulator to check out whether the, the um, operators are following the rules. So I think we have time to learn uh, as the 5G is becoming deployed in networks in the upcoming years. Uh, I think we will gradually be able to adjust how this should be done the best way. But in my understanding and in Barrack's understanding, uh, there should be no major problems for 5G uh, because of net neutrality. There may be problems, of course, uh, but we all um, are eager and, and positive to, to the 5G services. Uh, but let's give it time before we can see w what will happen. And, and of course, um, in parallel to this special services, we will have the internet access. And there will of course be a competition between internet access services and the specialized services. So it remains to be seen uh, how this develops. Okay, turning to um, IP interconnection. I was asked to also present something about IP interconnection. Uh, in my understanding, uh, IP interconnection is not directly related to net neutrality. But indirectly, of course, the discussion often pops up at the same time. First, a few basic things. Uh, this may be well known to many of you, but, but to give the overview in the beginning. Uh, IP interconnection has traditionally been done in a few specific ways. First of all, the ISPs have been interconnected directly. They exchange traffic, um, but they don't take any payment for sending traffic one or the other way. This is called peering, um, uh, or today you often would have to say settlement-free peering to express that it doesn't cost any money. This way of exchanging traffic and not exchanging money, one could say, is often called bill and keep whereby each ISP collects um, uh, revenue from, from the end users uh, and based on that they uh, have their business model. They don't send any money to another ISP based on this simple way of interconnecting. And this is different from telephony of course. But this is not sufficient. Uh, in many cases, you need to connect to the wider internet. And then the transit uh, way of connecting is introduced in addition to that. Uh, these two ISPs may be lower level ISPs, lower tier ISPs. And they would need to connect to a higher tier ISP. Here it's called uh, the ISP T for transit. And in that case, there will be a payment flowing from ISP A and B towards this transit provider. But this transit provider there then also provides you with connection to the rest of the internet. For many years these two ways of connecting and, and exchanging uh, money has been used as the, the two basic building blocks for interconnection of the internet. 
This is changing gradually these days, on the other hand. Uh, one thing that is important also to keep in mind is that you can do regulation of the traffic uh, based on other measures than sending the traffic directly between networks. In many cases, the same traffic is sent many times. If you are watching a movie, uh, many users may be watching the same movie. So uh, if it's sent from the US, for example, it's not necessary to, to download it all the way from the US to, to Korea to, to watch it. It could be sent once towards Korea and be stored in, in a so-called cache server or caching server. And thereby, many users could watch the same movie. And this is, is an important factor to, to reduce the traffic on the internet. So it helps to, to limit the amount of traffic on the internet. At the same time, it also introduces the discussion about when you are connecting this caching server to the ISP, should it be settlement free or should you pay for it? That's of course also an ongoing discussion. It's important to notice that even though uh, the letter N for network is in this concept, the CDN is usually not a network. It's only many servers that are connected to the network. So the blue bubbles here are networks, but the servers, they are computers. Big computers with, with high capacity or a lot of storage, but they don't contain any network. There is no network inside here. So even though this is called a content delivery network, it doesn't contain any network elements. It only contains servers, it's endpoints, many endpoints uh, working together intelligently, but there is no network. There may be in some cases, so it, it's not um, um, always like this, but in many cases, this is how CDNs are implemented. Um, before we go into how, how uh, charging and then the connection is considered in Europe, I want to give a few ideas, thoughts for your mind, which you can use when, when you uh, consider these difficult questions, because in many cases you have, have deep discussions about interconnection. First of all, I would like to emphasize that uh, the Internet is a cooperation between internet service providers on the one hand and content and application providers on the other hand. So uh, the content and application provider would not be able to provide the content to the end user if there were no internet service providers providing this connection. This is all often emphasized by the ISP and it's correct. But we should not forget that it's also the other way around. Because the ISP would not be able to send, sell any connection if there were no content on the internet. Because nobody wants to buy an empty connection with no content. So the content provider is also important for the ISP. So it's a win-win uh, situation. Sometimes also uh, the growth of the traffic on the internet is expressed as a problem. Oh, there is so much traffic, I'm not able to transport it. Um, how can I manage? Uh, but of course, uh, if you have a shop and you are selling goods in the shop, it's usually not a problem if, if the customers are buying all the goods. Then you are just producing more goods so you can sell even more. And earn more money. So usually when you have something that is that has a high demand, then it's a successful business. So therefore the more traffic there is on the internet, the more successful the internet is. And therefore also the more successful the ISP is. Of course the ISP would need to fund more network and build capacity etc etc so it's not cheap to expand the business that is not what I say but it's a very good business opportunity
Sometimes it's also argued that the content and application providers are not contributing to, to the connectivity on the internet. This is not correct as far as Barrick has been able to understand. Um, the, the content providers are also buying access to the internet. And as far as Barrick has been able to understand, um, the value chain consisting of all the stakeholders on, on, on the internet is, uh, is covering the ISP's cost. Um, and it's also important to emphasize that the current model has been um, um, uh, stimulating the innovation on the internet and that, that is also one of the underlying um, arguments for, for net neutrality. This has been successful for many years uh, and we should consider this to be possible for the foreseeable future too. Uh, <coughs> When it comes to in, uh, internet interconnection, uh, I can describe briefly how the situation is in Europe. This description is based on, on the Barrack report from 2017. Uh, and the situation is described uh, at a high level like this. The, the internet traffic volume continues to increase and, and more and more because of video streaming. Earlier it was uh, often mentioned peer-to-peer -peer traffic, but these days it's more video streaming that is the important driver of, of the development of the traffic. Uh, Beric has also observed that the prices for transit and CDN services is uh, declining, uh, so it's considered to be a competitive market. And it's also um, become me more and more clear the last years that CDNs are very important. They are contributing to uh, limitation of the traffic. Um, so it, it's uh, an, an important element of, of the traffic um, budget on, on the internet. Uh, it has also been observed that uh, there has been uh, gradually becoming more paid peering, so it's not only settlement-free peering that is happening in, in Europe. Um, so this is also a trend we have seen. Uh, in the question whether regulators should regulate IP interconnection, it has been seen for the, the previous years that um, the disputes between the stakeholders in the market has been solved without regulatory intervention. So sometimes there has been uh, brief uh, interruptions in, in the traffic, but usually these cases has been solved relatively quickly without regulatory intervention. So therefore one could say there is not uh, an overall regulation of IP interconnection in Europe. There has not been a need for that. When it comes to different charging models, um, one could compare it with uh, how um, interconnection of telephony is done. Uh, you may know, uh, at least in Europe, it's like this. When, when you call, it, it's, it's, it's the caller who pays for the call throughout uh, the networks towards the, the receiver of the call. Um, the money is sent uh, based on, on uh, traffic measurements from the different uh, providers along the chain. So there is, there is transferring of money between the different operators. Um, previously, these operators have been regulated to some extent in Europe, but lately uh, the regulation has um, Converge to a situation where most of the regulation is done for the terminating networks. Because uh, when you have a network and you are receiving calls, 
you will have a monopoly of handling these calls. It's impossible to reach this subscriber in uh, any other way than through this operator number B. It's not the same situation for the transit because in many cases there are alternative transits. So then it's not a monopoly in the same way. So therefore, there is still a price regulation of the terminating telephony markets in Europe. If you compare how internet traditionally has been charged and how money is sent from one operator to another one, as we have discussed uh, previously, uh, the money is flowing from the endpoints towards the center. And therefore, there is no termination monopoly in this charging model. And this may be the main reason why there it has not been uh, necessary to regulate the connection between ISPs. It has been proposed um, globally. I understand there is also uh, this concept in, in Korea, but it has been proposed, as uh, I will describe uh, afterwards, globally to introduce uh, this new or alternative way of handling charging on the internet, which is called sending party network pays. This model is a bit similar to the calling party network pays, which we have in telephony. But it's also different because it's charging in both directions. So it's not the calling party because usually when you, for example, are watching a movie, the calling party is here. So if it had been calling party, then this provider, sorry, this end user would have been paying. But if you have sending party network pays, this two-way communication is split into two paths. And in that case, also this endpoint would be considered as a separate stream of packets. And therefore, you would have termination of packets in both ends. For the stream towards the right hand side you will have termination in network B. For packets sent from the right hand side you will have termination of these packets under A. So it would be a, a movement from um, the bill and keep model that traditionally has been used on the internet. Uh, this sending party network pace uh, was once proposed for the um, ITU. ITU has conferences of international telecommunications. Um, these conferences are conducted uh, in irregular intervals. Uh, but there was such a conference in 2012. And as you can see, the previous one was many years earlier than that, so it's not happening often. But it was suggested in 2012 to introduce this charging principle uh, on the internet uh, based on an uh, uh, ITU uh, regulation. But it, it was after a long discussion and uh, not any agreement to do that, so it was not uh, implemented. Uh, in this occasion, Barrack also produced a statement about this uh, charging model. And one of the arguments uh, is that um, due to this uh, termination problem that it would introduce, uh, it would probably not be a good idea because it would increase the need for regulation uh, on the internet. And, and as long as, uh, at least the way it is in Europe these days, as long as, as the, the um, dialogue between the stakeholders in the market uh, are reaching agreements without intervention from the authorities, then such a model should be pursued. That was uh, the general view of Barrack in, in that occasion. Briefly about zero rating. Uh, zero rating, um, as many of you may know already, is uh, a model where uh, 
some content is exempted from the payment. It's typically used in, in uh, mobile networks, so you usually have a, a data cap, a data quota that you can use on your internet access. And uh, if you are downloading a lot of traffic, uh, you may exceed the quota, and then you would have to pay additional money to, to have a larger uh, quota. Zero rating would be uh, a business model where specific content is exempted from that. In, in Norway, for example, we have uh, um, uh, subscriptions where music streaming is exempted. So you can listen to music streaming as much as you want without taking any of the data from the data quota. That's one example. To speed a little bit up, I skip one of the slides. Um, when you relate zero rating to net neutrality, uh, we can note that zero rating is an application specific measure. So it's some applications that are zero rated while other applications are not zero rated. It doesn't mean that it necessarily is, is um, breaching the net neutrality. It's, it's a discussion whether zero rating is a net neutrality specific uh, problem or, or not. But we have seen in Europe that before the net neutrality regulation was introduced, uh, there were examples of blocking of traffic. For example, voice over IP was blocked in, in some mobile networks. But after the regulation was introduced, this was not allowed anymore. So the operators had to stop blocking traffic. After that, we have seen that more and more operators in Europe in almost every European country now, we have zero rating products coming up. So there has been a shift, one could say, from technical discrimination over to e economic discrimination. This influences um, how the end users are using the internet. If something is for free, you have a tendency to be more interested in using free content than if there is other content you have to pay for. It could also introduce entry barriers if some content application providers are included while others are not. So this has problematic uh, side effects that uh, you would have to consider when you assess a case. Very few countries in the world has a regulation of zero rating. Um, there are two exceptions in Canada and India and there is some, some limitation of zero rating in California, which are some examples you could look into if you are interested in this topic. Um, in um, the European law, uh, the zero rating concept is not mentioned explicitly in, in the regulation, but uh, the, the term commercial practices is used and zero rating is considered to be an example of, of that. <coughs> In the law, uh, zero rating is not explicitly prohibited and it's not explicitly allowed. So in some cases, zero rating is, is accepted. Uh, in many cases, actually, zero rating is still accepted in European countries. The way it has been uh, agreed in BAREC to handle these cases is to take an overall assessment of each case. So it's a case-by-case -case assessment. And when you do this case-by-case -case assessment, you go through different criteria to see, uh, to look at the effect of, <coughs> of the product. <coughs> These um, uh, criteria are the market position of the ISP. So if it's a larger ISP, then it's more problematic than if it's a smaller ISP, for example. Then you have to look at the effects of the content providers and the market position of the content providers. You have the same situation, larger cap is more problematic than a smaller cap. And in particular, if some caps are excluded from the market, then it's uh, important to take into account. You also need to take into account the effect on the end user. So the, the end user is, is uh, stimulated to use a particular type of content in that case and the smaller the data cap is uh, the more incentive you have as an end user to use the free content 
So therefore, smaller data caps is more problematic than larger data caps. And finally, um, the fourth uh, main uh, criteria is the scale of the practice. So uh, typically in the beginning, uh, very few uh, consumers are using uh, the product. So you, you can't, in the beginning, uh, at least it has not happened so far, uh, stop uh, a commercial practice like, like this. But in case it takes over the market and non-zero rated uh, products uh, become uh, um, have, have a s small usage, little usage, in that case uh, it, it could become problematic. There is also this safeguard um, criteria about circumvention of the regulation. Um, I would also add before I, I look at the, the Norwegian cases that um, Many of the zero rating products has a combination of commercial practice and technical practice. Uh, with technical practice, I mean traffic management. So uh, many of the zero rating cases in Europe has been uh, determined based on the technical elements of the service. So in, in that case, if there is a technical um, inconsistency with, with this product, uh, then it's easier, of course, to say that this product is not allowed to have in the market. Because you ha don't have to go through this criteria. But if it's a pure commercial practice and there is no technical problems with the product, in that case you have to go through this full analysis. <coughs> Norway is one of the few uh, countries in Europe uh, that has taken uh, an assessment of a case that is purely based on the commercial practice. Uh, we have still allowed the product in the market, but we, we had uh, uh, concerns for the product, and these concerns are, are similar to, to the barrier criteria. There is a significant market position of the ISPs. <coughs> there is a limited number of caps included in, in the product, and the data caps are relatively small, and the scale of the practice is relatively small uh, when we did the assessment. This has changed a little bit over time, so, so um, the, the scale is, is uh, gradually increasing, but we have recently seen that uh, larger data caps has become available in the Norwegian market, so this may also influence how this product will develop over time, but it remains to be seen how, how that will, will affect uh, the product. But this is an example about how zero rating uh, is assessed by the regulator in, 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 in Europe. So there is not a clear-cut answer to, to these questions. Uh, while many of the technical questions are, are more clear-cut, something is allowed or not allowed, but, but zero rating uh, demands a, a more comprehensive assessment by the, the, the regulator to, to draw a conclusion. So that ends my, my presentation. If you want to read more about European regulation of net neutrality, uh, you have three sources on the top here that describes the whole regulation. The first one is the regulation itself, the, the law. Then you have the guidelines from BAREC, digging into the details. And I also have written uh, uh, an, an article, um, uh, a paper about it, which is, is more... more uh, high level, so, so it's a quick introduction to this topic, and it also digs a little bit into the technical details. For some of the specific uh, questions I covered in my presentation, I also have some references here that may be interesting to you. There is a, a relatively fresh um, opinion, so-called opinion to, to, to the lawmakers about how the regulation is working in the market. I have um, in informed you about IP interconnection in Europe and also this statement about the sending party network pace and also this zero rating assessment done in, in, in Norway. These four papers may be interesting for you if you want to dig into some of the specific topics I presented. Thereby, I say thank you very much for listening.
my long speech and looking forward to discussion afterwards.